Welcome um, to our um, Diverse Ed and Lifter webinar this afternoon. It's lovely that you've been able to join us. We are recording because we've got lots of people who want to be here but can't be here yet. So today is about thinking about this idea of weaving diverse narratives into the curriculum through human stories. If I've not met you before, my name is Hannah Wilson. I'm one half of the co-founders of Diverse Ed and Benny, the other co-founder, is here and you'll be hearing from her shortly. So if you don't know who Diverse Ed is, our vision is that everyone is celebrated in every classroom and every school. So tonight is really about thinking about how we celebrate diverse identities and diverse lived experiences. Um, how we do that, our mission is to collaborate, hence why we're doing this webinar tonight, build community um, and celebrate the successes and amplify the stories of diverse people. And hopefully you're going to go away with lots of ideas from our school based case studies and from the team at Lifter around how you can do that in a meaningful and in an authentic way. Here is Lizzie, one of our other speakers. Um, and then our values. So we promote acceptance over tolerance. We don't particularly like the British value of tolerance. So thinking about acceptance, thinking about who's visible, who's being celebrated, who's got a sense of belonging and the commitment to ongoing learning, which is why we're hopefully all here um, tonight. And we just want to really emphasize that doing this work in line with the Equality Act is about intersectionality and holistic approaches, thinking about all nine of the protected characteristics and how we do this work in an intersectional way rather than a single issue way. So perhaps thinking tonight about who is the community you are serving, what identities they hold, but what opportunities can we create to actually learn beyond our own spheres of influence and our own sort of reference points to understand others and other people's experiences of the world as well. And please do use our website, lots and lots of free resources on there and lots of um, toolkits and blogs and supporting um, resources to help you and your colleagues on their journey doing meaningful DEI work. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Benny Carver, the co-founder of Diverse Ed and the author um, of The Little Guide to Diversity in Schools, who's going to be talking about pedagogy. So Benny, over to you. Uh, thanks, Hannah. It's really nice to see people here. I know that it's the um, end of the day, so the commitment is uh, appreciated. I'm going to be talking about how um, stories are really important. And when we think about why we choose to include them, um, you know, what does that actually mean and what does it look like in the classroom? Um, Hannah, are we doing a next slide, please? Type we are. <laughs> Um, so I don't have my own clicker. Um, I want to start with the psychology behind stories. And when we think about uh, why stories matter, essentially what we're doing is kind of building a young person's capacity to feel empathy. And um, the way that we do that, the way a child develops empathy is through their ability to engage with a story in some sort of way, to see humans who are different from them um, as a an individual as apart from um, as opposed to from a homogenous group. Uh, so when we hear the story of a, a particular refugee or a particular person from a, a, a different country, um, what we've got is the ability to say, there are things that we share in common or I am understanding um, their situation. And so we don't have these homogenous masses. We don't have refugees and the homeless and uh, people of different races. We have that person's name in the, in the mouths of the, the children children that we teach. Um, and I think the Empathy Museum, yes, there is an Empathy Museum, uh, sums it up really well. So this idea that stories have a transformative power um, and the, the fact that uh, Claire Patey says, you know, we can relate to that individual much, much more easily when we understand their stories. And as an English teacher, you can definitely see that to be true. We, we select our, our stories um, on the basis of how, um, obviously how, um, important the literature is, but also in how they're going to expose children to a, a much broader mindset than the ones they have particularly uh, currently. Next slide, please, Hannah. Um, there's a caveat in that, in that where we have told stories previously, we haven't always considered what kind of stories we are telling. And when we think about how children create the foundation for their understanding of the world, we often talk about schema as something that we apply to kind of curriculum subjects. But I strongly believe that there is a schema uh, for our understanding of society. Um, some of it called some you can you can describe that as the kind of uh, knowledge base that almost leads to bias um, or acceptance, you know that schema 
the the building blocks in which we kind of throw different bits of information that starts to stick over time so the question i ask about the stories that we choose to tell is if all of those stories are through the lens of uh, characters being victims so disabled characters being victims or black characters being victims well how do we actually what schema are we building for um the students in front of us we're not building a particularly positive schema in next slide please hannah i'll give you an example of the schema that potentially was formed in my own head um, and bearing in mind my family are east african asian um, and so africa should feel like a place um, that was rich and varied for me even though i was born here but the reality was this the single story i was told about africa was that it was a place of um um, deficit. It was a, a place of oppression or an oppressed place. And all of those things are true in some way, shape and form, but it, that was the, the single story. So I learned in the 80s at primary school that everybody in, in Africa needed um, food. They were they were starving. Uh, I then went on to learn um, that uh, Africans were enslaved. And again, all of this is true. But it, what else was I learning? What was missing from the narrative around what Africa actually means as a continent um, and not just a, a place where people have been heavily oppressed? Uh, where was my understanding of medieval? evil kingdoms for example and the riches of africa and the technology of africa and even when we think about the diaspora when we think about africans in other places um again it was through the lens of victim of so by the time we get to uh, civil rights the image Im embedded in my head was of the broken body of emmett till so you know when we think about the schema that was formed about africa and africans it was really limited and how do you see people as human beings with individual lives with richness and agency and advocate you know the the fact that they can advocate for themselves if you only have this single story um next slide please hannah so I want to think about uh, some of the other ways in which our stories um, have been damaging for our students, because it's not just about Africa. What we tend to do is tell single stories about lots of different groups of people. So if we think about empire, for example, what story have we told about empire? And I often talk about this. Um, in with regard to the idea that you know we're told that empire civilized India um, and that's kind of told as established fact or certainly has been in the past um, been relayed to children as established fact um, and where are we telling some more of the truths around what happened with empire how is that story um, taking on the concepts of truth and reconciliation because and i take that that, that phrase deliberately as something that you know comes from um apartheid and something that comes from actually now canadian first nations um discussions this idea of truth and reconciliation where in our stories in britain do we tell the uh, the truths and um start to think about what reconciliation looks like as opposed to this very dichotomous uh, no it was wonderful uh, yes it was awful that kind of thing and we've got to consider about the the kind of the balance in our stories as well and um, similarly when we come to lgbt history we tend to pick figures um, who are, yes, important in terms of subjects, but again, fit into this narrow stereotype of um, LGBT committing suicide. So if you look at Alan Turing, yes, he's a really prominent figure, but there is actually a trope in LGBT society and culture about if you appear in a book, if you appear in a film, if you appear in a history, you're only important if you die. This idea that you kill off your LGBT um, uh, figures, characters, and Alan Turing is an example of that. My favourite look at how we tell damaging stories is looking at disability. And yes, there is a picture of Darth Vader here. And there's a lot of work been done around um, how people with disabilities have been presented. So there's lots of different tropes. So the disabled character as a, a villain, the villainous character, often disfigured, 
often uh, limb different or um, with facial scarring or scarring of some sort in the body. Um, and when we consider how the impact that has on the social schema for children who are learning about disability, you learn from Disney very, very early on. And in fact, a lot of our fairy tales very early, early on that disabled bodies are linked with immorality and are linked with mental defect. Um, and that's something that's embedded in our culture um, and can really formulate perhaps the negative views on people with disabilities or certainly dismissive views of people with disability later on. It's not just villainy though, it's the idea of helplessness. It's the idea of um, you can only be present in the story as a person with a disability if you are triumphing over your disability. Um, and again, I think, you know, for some people with disabilities, there's an inherent ordinariness to be dealt with when it comes to disability. We're not always uh, triumphing over our, um, our disabilities on a daily basis and certainly that's not the only story worth telling so what would we go on to do hannah well there's lots of things one of the there's and i'll go through why i've chosen this selection of images um in the top uh left hand corner here we've got the idea of uh, equal stories so is the story of a young woman from bangladesh given equal status in our curriculum in our classrooms um to the story of a young girl from Birmingham. Um, do we actually look at the stories in our books and give them equal weighting so that we've got a sense that a story from Japan and a story from Greece are given equal weighting? So we're not thinking about um, kind of the, the white Western European uh, post enlightened world or, or ancient world as the canonical world that we want to teach everybody, but we're actually thinking about how cultures outside of ours have contributed to the narratives that we that we provide. At the bottom of the screen, we've got two women, two Indian women, in fact. Um, when we're talking about women in particular, how far are we telling stories where women have agency and women have uh, achieved highly um, in their field, in their profession. The two figures you've got here are Sophia Dalip Singh, who was a suffragette and really famous character. I do recommend uh, that you go and look her up. And the Rani of Jansi, who was the counterpart to Queen Victoria. Uh, do we tell her story with equal balance to the stories of the suffragettes? Uh, do we tell Sophia's story with equal balance to the suffragettes? Do we tell the Rani of Jansi story in, in alignment with um, Queen Victoria as a counterpart, if you like? The image in the middle is of um, the Hijra in India. And I wonder how often we are referencing how global cultures deal with what we think of our Western problems, issues, if that's what we want to, to think about it as. I think of it as our society. Um, and you know, we're, we're talking about trans issues in, in our schools, in our societies, but are we looking at how First Nations cultures um, deal with the idea of transgender people or how India deals with the idea of transgender people? What are the legal protections? Yes, we've got to talk about perhaps the, the, the disadvantages as well, but we've got to present perhaps some of the positives around Around the stories there. And finally, looking at the stories we tell about our subjects, because within our subjects, maths, English, science, this, for me as a, as a teacher, this is particularly relevant. We often tell the story of engineering as this kind of post enlightenment, particularly um, Western idea, where we know that the earthworks of Benin are phenomenal and stand to this day. We often talk about astronomy um, as being, again, a white Western European post enlightenment uh, endeavor but the Dogon people of Mali, we're talking about Sirius A and Sirius B, perhaps not in those words, but these, these twin stars long before our scientists um, in the West um, had identified them. Um, the Ashango bones of um, Africa looking at tallying and the origins of maths and maths being something that is African um, in, in heritage as much as it is white Western European. So the question I'm asking is, how far do we expose our students to the range of stories that are available to them. Um, I think that's my last slide, Hannah, it is. So we've got time for questions. I'm going to pause. If you do have any questions, now would be a good time to ask or comments or additions. Feel free to unmute and ask a question or you can pop it into the chat if you want me to read it out to Benny. She's got four minutes to share her wisdom. <laughs> 
Hi, Benny. Oh, Becky, um, go for it. It's me, Becky, sorry. Um, in school, we're using um, a collection of work called From the Prosperity Project, which has been really informative for some of our teachers who are not necessarily as educated yet in diversity. So you've, you've mentioned things in your presentation and I'm thinking, I have never heard of that before. So where, where, where do we go for this front of knowledge? We've got the Prosperity Project, but is there someone else, somewhere else where we can research and gain access to? Um, is there some, because I think as a teacher, your time's very limited. Mm -hmm. And if you can go to a resource, then it, 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 it just support you. Yeah, there are lots of books on the market. I think what you're probably looking for is a really good book list um, of uh, people who have taken specific um, cultural histories and turned them into actually you know, some you know, works that are available on the market. Um, I do have a Padlet, um, which I will dig out and send to Hannah so that she can send around to the delegates where um, I've gleaned a lot of information. Um, and sometimes it's just, uh, just as important just to go, do you know what, I don't know uh, about the origins of maths I don't know um, about how much astrology was happening in in Africa what, and what that actually meant um, and what we're looking at doing here as, as teachers is going well I've got this blind spot so can I go out and google it you know look for the books that are relevant and then it, it's it's a long process no one has this information at their fingertips it's taken me a while to collect it um, but I think endless curiosity helps as well this idea that you know as a teacher, how much more is there for me to know? And what can I then pass on to my students? Thank great you. question, Becky. And, and a, it's a great question. A follow up question from Anthony. Um, we lack diverse resources in libraries and we need more global majority writers and authors. Do, do, he works in the university. Do schools have this or how can we get the librarian on board, Benny? So I have to say librarians are our champions um, and librarians often um, are at the, for, uh, the the vanguard of all of this. You know, my librarian at school has more diversity on display than any library I've ever worked in. There's a real shift in, in library discussions about what diverse literature looks like for students. And what's great is that teachers are saying, you know, actually that that's not a book that's just a reading for pleasure book. That's a book that um, I can actually pull into the curriculum. Um, and for example, in on uh, Jennifer Webb's website, the Funky Pedagogy website, there is a reading project where teachers have crowdsourced uh, diverse books that you should have in your library, but also would be appropriate for the curriculum as well. Um, so I do think there's some, some really good work going on there. Um, and the Independent Library Association has, um, has also kind of put out some material on it. It's worth connecting on Twitter with, with those people because they are fantastic. Yeah, I was going to add as well that Inclusion Labs, who are one of our collaborative partners, have got two pledges, one around diversity in governance and one around diversity in literature. So you can sign up as a school to that pledge um, as well. And I, but if you've got a DEI working party in your school, make sure the librarian has been invited to join because they do have a massive sphere of influence. Mandy, your hand was up and it's now gone. Has your question been answered? <laughs> Where is she? No. Hi, Benny. Hi, Hi Mandy. Hello, everyone. Hi, um, yes, I was just going to make the comment in terms of the materials. If we think about it logically, and I'm saying logically only because this is my background in from the Caribbean, where do we get our books from? Well, we get them from the library. We get them from bookstores. And a lot of the publishers are actually British. So Macmillan and, and lots of publishers that you get your books from, they have a, a strand for Africa, for the Caribbean, for all over the place. So it's worth just checking those very publishers and asking about the ranges that they have on offer. It's not something that you would necessarily think about, but it begs the question, why are books put in categories? Aren't they just books? Great point, Mandy, about it's another, um, another space that really needs disrupting. I follow quite a lot of the dialogue on um, Twitter in particular about publishers and diversifying publishing spaces so Benny you're off the hook thank you very much for squeezing us into your timetabling I know you're mega busy Benny is now going to disappear please do send her a tweet she will respond on Twitter to any questions she's missed lovely to see you I'm going to hand over to team Anna and Harriet and um, over to you too
Well, hello everyone. So this is uh, this is Anna. I'm Harriet. <laughs> You're going to hear for both of us. Um, um, I am head of education research at Lifter, um, and I am. I thank you very much, Benny, for that because I, I hope I'm going to segue a little bit because I'm going to start with a little bit of a story of of, of what, how Lifter came about, um, because. We, uh, well, I've always been working since I was a teacher onwards in the field called global citizenship education, critical global learning, development education, which uh, there's different interpretations, but you could go back to the 50s or 60s and, and how it emerged. Um, loose collaboration of, of educators who were motivated by global social justice and sustainability. Um, I'll just segue, I'll just signpost the toolkit on that, Hannah Butch, and on the Diverse Ed website, because actually I bring those things together because there is an, a huge range of resources that, that speak to some of those questions as well so on things like the Global Dimension website. But it's, it was a, an organ, a loose collection of different people working in different forms of adjectival education, from peace education, um, uh, human rights education, all sorts of things. And when uh, the sustainable development goals come out, and I'm just going to link to those, I'm, I don't know if it, you've heard of these before, but these are United Nations global goals for a more just and sustainable world. There are 17 goals. That they were launched in 2015 to replace the Millennium Development Goals, and they concern all countries everywhere. They have 100, all, all signatories, and they are all profoundly interlinked. And this was the first time we had a really clear framework for bringing together global social justice movements, which might include some of those projects that were born out of a development education pedagogy, so linked to Benny's talk, the, the Dangers of a Single Story by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie was, is, is part of our training, for example, of teachers in terms of exposing and exploring some of the pedagogy that would be required to take more of that sort of approach. But what this is wonderful for this framework for uh, sustainable development throughout the whole world is it brings together all sorts of complex Volcker global uncertain issues and recognizes that they are profoundly interlinked, that you are not going to achieve climate justice without health and well-being, you are not going to achieve quality education without the education of women or the ending of poverty. So each of these goals have uh, profoundly interlinked, each of them have targets and indicators and one of the targets in which a lot of us may sit be situated as educators um, is target four um a point uh, sorry goal four which is all about education and target seven and this is where it brings together global social justice making the world a better place both for self and for other and the importance of bridging empathy gaps if we're going to also address our world most pressing world crisis issues. Um, so from things like the, and it recognizes the interrelationship between human rights and um, nonviolence and education and all that, that sort of thing. But most of us who are working in this field probably situated here. I could go off on a tangent as I am very well known to do um, and talk a little bit more about the critics of the SDGs but I'm going to leave it there. Let's just recognize that there are, they're not perfect, they are the best we've got in terms of a blueprint for a better world but they are a framework that have really helped, oh where can I go next? <laughs> they are one of the frameworks that are quite useful for when you're doing curriculum enrichment work, when you're looking at developing and broadening the curriculum so that it's relevant and brings in real world issues. But what's challenging is how do you bridge that gap between complex abstract concepts and issues and the, 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 underst the understanding of them, the need to change and shift behavior if those issues are so far removed from your daily life. Now, in, in some ways, uh, there are issues that are on our doorstep, but maybe when it comes to global concepts like deforestation and the, how that affects the lives of people there, or the, the lack of representation of indigenous knowledge within certain decisions that are being made about sustainable development, 
what is it how can we bridge that gap and if you take three frameworks like this totally different ones and they're just slightly randomly picked but one you might be familiar with is the sort of language that Ofsted are using for enriching and deepening and broadening the curriculum so concepts albeit again I could go for tangent as a sociologist of education and critique the Ofsted interpretation of cultural capital but uh, if we if if you take a, a broader and and sensitive uh, interpretation of that it's a, an interesting concept as is critical digital literacy all these demands on schools to get these skills competencies and values for a increasingly complex increase, increasingly unknown and unknowable and uncertain world and then a framework that we might also be a bit more familiar that's more established like the convention of the rights of the child it might be that schools are doing unicef's rights respecting school award for example and we take concept frameworks like that and we ask what is it that they all have in common and if I had more time, I'd get you to reflect on that. We don't, so I will give you one of one answer amongst many, one perspective amongst many, and that is that they are all, and un they're underpinning all of them is this concept of human flourishing, and. If, we often work with, I have over the years in different, different roles as an educator, as a lecturer, as an NGO, a collaborator. And it has been one of those things that come out when we reflect upon what is the purpose of education? Why are we doing what we're doing? And if we're talking about the self in relation to others, the concept I think of human flourishing is a really good one. Um, again, it's got flaws, but it talks to academic flourishing, social and emotional flourishing. And if we talk about social, social justice in relation to person and planet, it also bridges some of those gaps. So lift up, I'm just gonna take some water. Mm -hmm. Lifter, for those that don't know, um, is a platform where we introduce everyone, students, teachers, to a huge collection of human stories from around the world. It is a digital immersive learning experience whereby you start in a 360 um, world where that person that you're about to meet is situated often in their bedrooms or their homes, a, a place of comfort and you connect with the sounds and the, and the experiences. I'm not gonna show this actually too much because as the other people speak after me, I'm hoping the jigsaw puzzle will put, be put together, but I'm also gonna put a link for anyone who, would, who doesn't know Lifter to come and have a free trial. But the core concepts and increasingly the focus areas, and this is arising from both research but also motivation for use as to how this is becoming incredibly helpful. It's supporting some emotion, social and emotional learning. So speaking to some points, a point that's already been raised and it's gonna be raised again. Diversity, equity, inclusion, of course, um, intercultural capital, cultural capital, um, character education, sustainability, global citizenship. And underpinning all of this is the requirement for critical media literacy, which is again rooted in a critical pedagogy and development education methodology, which is always all about looking for um, using a power analysis, looking at where the power lies and why, what's the history, what's made it so, and is it fair? Is it socially just? Is it representative? Um, and these human stories then are, all real, they're all authentic. And from my point of view, I'm finding, oh, I've done it again. <laughs> Are we gonna show you, I'm gonna just show you a little excerpt, a one minute excerpt of one of our um, collection of story worlds, which is a collection of films from young people all around the world. Oh, in this country, it's five, five story, well, five, five, five stories, five young people who come from five different countries. They all meet up in Norway to play football. And it's each of their stories and their, 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 they're, they are only, we, we make this very clear when we talk about the, the, the pedagogy of this, which again, I think is really important in this session, that they are 
partial and incomplete in the sense that they are just glimpses into someone's life. They, they are not representative of a culture or a country. We don't claim that in any shape or form. But what's interesting and coming out of the research is with the increased exposure to more and more stories from around the world, young people are more likely to see themselves represented in all sorts of ways, not just in really overt visual ways, in lots of other ways. And um, this is what keeps us going. This is why we work very hard with local filmmakers all around the world and documentary makers. We work with Anna and I are the education team with Leah. Um, and then we also have these technical experts and together we, we work with this product. And that globe you see in front of you that spins and you zoom down into these worlds and into these experiences, but it's best experienced yourself. This is why I think we'll send you the link. But here's a little glimpse into some of our films. It's just a minute. How am I doing time with Hannah just before we press play? Okay. Oh, right. Okay. So actually, I've just seen that we're running over. It's so. all right. Do the clip. Do the clip. It's all good. Yeah, clip. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so sorry if that glitched a little bit there, but we'll, we'll hopefully have an opportunity to, to, to show you a little bit more in a minute. But I just want to sit on this next slide and then I'll let other people illustrate a little bit more afterwards about how this works in classrooms. But they, so I've been collecting and working with schools to collect some data and impact data. Um, and one of the studies that I've recently done, which is a primary school where we've been looking at all the different ways that this is used. And this particular school in Three Bridges in, um, in, in Southall in London, they have used it for lots of different reasons, but the three, speaking to our focus areas with social and emotional learning, the, Anna, Anna in that story, the, the little film that you've just seen, one of our characters, for want of a better word, again, the real life people, has uh, an, a disappointment, huge disappointment in this experience. And young people really relate to the disappointment. And in fact, a teacher used it to um, just to uh, prepare his year sixes for the news of the house captains, which he knew would be an emotional affair. And he, he claims this was the first year that it, they handled it really, really well. And it was because they spent a whole day exploring this, ex the emotional reaction of Anna and why and how they would react in that situation. So it really speaks to the core concepts of the neuroscience of social and emotional learning, but also they've been using it a lot for cultural capital, intercultural capital, recognizing crucially the capital that children already bring to the classroom. This is vital, They're not, it's not a deficit model, but recognizing too that this brings in experiences and environments that they would not otherwise have the chance of ever experiencing. Uh, experiencing. So that that is probably, I was gonna talk about another school where they're really working with the community and using it to promote oracy and communication skills and the evidence of that building confidence and some lovely other special needs settings, but we, that's enough. I'll stop there. And if there's any points of clarification, I can also answer them in the message as we go along but I up to you Hannah as to how you want to know yeah now. pop comments or questions for Harriet in the chat and she can answer them whilst Anna takes over so Anna over to you 
Cool, I will be super speedy, I promise. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Anna Shpakovska. Um, I was until last year a secondary school English teacher, um, and I now work for Lifter as a professional development lead. So I do lots of uh, work around training with teachers. And I'm gonna be talking to you this afternoon about uh, mirrors, windows, and sliding doors. And some of you might have heard of this metaphor before, but don't worry, I am going to explain a little bit more about it. So um, where do these, where does this uh, metaphor come, come from? It comes from an academic called Rudine Sims Bishop, who's an African-American uh, academic who looks at uh, children's literature that deals with the African-American experience. And in her research, she uses this metaphor to describe the way in which stories um, can help children to, uh, at the very least, have a window into other people's lives. But when they're at their most powerful, they are providing mirrors to young people to show them representations of themselves and uh, possibly arguably they're most powerful when they provide uh, glass doors, when they allow young people to step into um, other, uh, other worlds and actually begin to empathize with, with, uh, with the people in, in the stories. And it's not just important for um, young people who've experienced marginalization and, and discrimination, it's also important for those young people that haven't experienced that as well. Um, because actually, I would argue that, that if we don't have an equal society, if we don't have equal representation, that doesn't just um, cause suffering for those that um, suffer discrimination, it's, it's, it's an injustice for us all. And actually those people um, who, who um, continually see themselves reflected in the stories that they read need to see others in the in the stories that they read to be fully equipped to have a, a, a full and fulfilling a, a life in which we can see the kind of human flourishing that, uh, that Harriet was touching on there. Um, I hope that you've got an opportunity to read the, the quotes. I'm just making sure I get everything in this afternoon and I'm sure that Hannah will be prepared to um, share the slides with you if you're if you're interested in reading more of this work. So I want us to, to take, a, take a moment to kind of think about uh, whether, our, whether our curriculum uh, within, our, within the schools that we're working in, whether it's truly representative. Um, and you can pop a comment into the chat. Um, I know what I think about at the time that I was in the classroom, uh, whether you feel that things that you're offering our, uh, our young people are truly representative of the community that you serve. And, and we might want to think about our communities just not just as a, the young people that we're serving but more broadly um, the towns the cities uh, and society more generally and interestingly some uh, some research that's been conducted there was some research that was conducted by uh, Pearson um, and the, there were two studies that they did one with uh, teacher tap and another one that they did independently and actually this re research showed that around 80 percent of secondary school uh, teachers and around uh, 70 60 to 70 percent of primary school teachers want more diverse uh, texts in their in their curricula and I think that we've heard that echoed by participants today saying we need to find out where to get these resources um, so as I've said, that, that research has been conducted by Pearson comes with it some, um, some recommendations. And one of those recommendations is around providing realistic representation. And when we do provide that realistic representation for our young people, it can have a really great impact. The things that it can help us to do is it can help us to create a sense of belonging. It can help reduce instances of bullying, um, mental health problems, and help to reduce barriers to achievement. I think if we think about the things that we want for the young people in our schools, those are all things that we'd really want to set ourselves as goals. So how can that be achieved? Um, so Harriet has already begun to talk about um, Lifter um, and Lifter is a platform that uses short documentary films um, and they are um, more often than not commissioned um, so that people from those communities are, are making the films themselves. Um, and so we, we believe they offer an authentic portrayal of people. Um, 
they cover a range of uh, protected char characteristics. And as, as Hannah has said, it's not just about looking at those in isolation, it's about looking at the way that they intersect and interact. Um, and it's not just about looking at that person's uh, identity, it's about making sure we look at a rounded portrayal of a human being and saying, this is, this is one aspect of, of who they are. And I'm gonna share a story with you in a second that I hope demonstrates that um, effectively. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about impact on students, because I think so often when we're at things like this, we lose the voice of young people. And um, this is taken from a study that, that, um, that I know that Harriet did with some, some um, students. Uh, and uh, after having experienced the story worlds, um, they, they talked about the, the fact that it made them realise that the people that they saw in the films were thinking about the things we do in our everyday lives. And they felt that all of the assumptions that they'd had before they were, were able to watch the film had been undone. And I just wanted to touch briefly on um, how immersive digital stories can help. I'm not going to show you uh, the 360. I know Becky later is going to show you um, using Lifter with her class, so you'll see the 360 experience. But research, and it's independent research, so it's not been res research commissioned by Lifter, but independent research by the University of Tampere has shown that actually mm -hmm. stories of this kind help to develop empathy and understanding for others. Uh, who are culturally different from themselves. So what we're going to do now is we are going to meet a young man called Dean Powell, and I challenge you not to absolutely fall in love with Dean Powell because he is adorable. It's probably one of my favourite stories from the platform. And what I'd really like us to think about, and I think that we're, we're going to maybe give a moment for reflection after this, just for you to either think about this or perhaps discuss it with a colleague if you've got an opportunity to do so, is how might this film help to challenge uh, misconceptions or any preconceptions that young people have about Sikhs. Um, so I'm going to do that. I hope the film's not glitchy. Fingers crossed for that. I might just clo close my Chrome. I'm just going to stop share actually and just close my internet to make sure that that's not going to interfere with it. And then what I'll do is I'll just share the film. What I'll do is I'll mute uh, whilst I share the film, uh, but we can have a moment for reflection after the film has finished. Nej. Åh <laughs> oh, nej. Det kan jeg også lave. Ja. Okay, det har jeg glemt. Gå derover, så gør vi lige det. Du glemmer meget åbenbart. Ja, er klar over, hvor meget jeg skal holde styr på? Åh, oh, for satan. Satan! Hvor du banner? Nej. Jeg hedder Den Pal Sing. Den Pal betyder hjælpsom, og mit efternavn betyder løve. Jeg drømmer om, at jeg kan blive fodboldspiller, når jeg bliver stor. Den skal jeg kaste mig på, den der. Ja, det skal du da. Jeg er en sikker, og jeg skal beskytte mit hår. Det går her til, når jeg står. Mit hår er aldrig blevet klippet, og det kommer det heller ikke til, fordi vores hår er en gave fra Gud. Jeg har flettet det lige nu. Jeg bliver altså nogle gange bange. Altså, jeg skal prøve at få det der med at være bange væk. Vi ses, din bad. Kom igen, drenge! Jeg vil gerne prøve, når jeg bliver voksen, at være verdens bedste målmand, som Peter Smeichel har været to gange. Ja, ja tak! Sådan! Det var godt, drenge! Så kunne vi finde ud af det! Det er en fald for mål. Jonas kommer ud. Men jeg bliver altså nogle gange bange for at kaste mig, fordi jeg sådan, tror, det går ondt. Det er fald ud, Ida! Op med hovedet, dreng! Tegn! 
Vi har så mange gange snakket om det der. Ikke noget panikmålspark. Jeg skal prøve at få det der med at være bange væk, og jeg skal være bedre til at lave målspark. Fordi det går ret tit galt. Okay, I hope you did enjoy meeting Dean Pal as much as I love revisiting him. I think I've probably seen that about 50 times and I still love seeing him every time I do. Um, I'm hyper aware that we're, we're running over, so I'm not going to kind of insist that we have lots of uh, sharing of feedback. But what would be wonderful is if anybody uh, would feel kind of uh, happy to share any reflections about the film um, in the chat. So anything that you felt about that film might help teachers or, or yourself uh, to, to challenge those misconceptions or preconceptions young people might have about Sikhs and equally if you have any questions um, about the presentation I've done or Lifter itself please do feel free to pop those in the chat and I will answer those and um, whilst the other presenters um, are talking I'm sure without taking away anything from what they're doing I will make sure that I, I do that discreetly thanks everybody yes yeah thank you Harriet um, and, and Anna we're now going to move into a couple of um, school case studies so we've got Becky from a primary school in the Midlands and Lizzie from a secondary school in London to really sort of like showcase and to articulate how they've embedded it in their school culture and in their school curriculum so Becky welcome and over to you thank you hello welcome everybody it's great to be here thank you for having me um, so I'm a teacher at a school in Leicester called Bronston Community Primary School. Our school is based on these four concepts, these four values, and they are thread throughout, and I mean throughout, our curriculum in everything that we do. The children recite them, the children know what they mean. Um, we introduced these values on a four year cycle. So we started with the idea of belong. The school that I work in is out of 46,000 schools in the country, we are number 912 on the deprivation index. So a really, really economically deprived school and also socially deprived as well. We, for a school in Leicester, with Leicester being an incredibly diverse city, we're actually, we do not have that such such great diverse population within our children. Um, we're on about 25% children who have English as additional language, which is really, really different to schools in Leicester, particularly city schools that are sort of 98, 99%, some are even 100%. So we felt very strongly about our school not ha having um, an identity. Um, and this was the start of it. So we started with the values of belong, care, persevere and succeed. And interestingly, um, they're actually part of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And we didn't realize at the time, but this is what we were thinking, this is what we're thinking, and this is what we knew we needed for our children because education historically for the children from our area was really, was not a priority. Um, and our parents' experiences of education was not always a positive one. So how did we start that journey? So. As a school, as a teacher, um, myself, I'm very conscious about diversity. My own children are African um, and they have faced a lot of prejudice as well. So I, as a very committed teacher for diversity within the classroom, I was really, really keen to get started with Lifter. Um, it was during lockdown. And I've actually got a clip of the very, very first time that I introduced Lifter to my class. Um, so. I literally, just to give you a bit of context to this, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I wasn't really making it up on the spot and I just wanted to see the children's reaction and their responses. And what it did was it just opened up. It was, we used it as a vehicle for the children to start talking about themselves. And I'll come back to the values of our school in a minute because Lifter has been significant in that. Um, so uh, if we could just play the video and just oh, just have a minute to time think. 360. Yeah, it's over here. Daily bread, Afghanistan. Let's go to Afghanistan. Let's see what it's like in Afghanistan. 
we'd, we'd been to a few different story worlds and, and we, no, we went to here. Where could we be? Where are we? Let's take a look around. Listen to the sound. Where could we be? Where are we? Where are we? A shop. We could be in a shop, yeah, but there's there's no shelves like there are shops in like they are in our shops in this country. There's no there's no big flashy till or checkout. And look what's outside. Maybe it's a shop that's just been built right now. Maybe it's a shop that's just been built. It's got posters on the wall. Look, can you see that, that lettering? That's lettering. That's a different type of alphabet to the one that are they, we use. Are we, are we looking at India? We're looking at Afghanistan. It's a really good question. Look at this. What's that man holding? It could be a bakery. It could be a bakery. What makes you say that? I don't know, it just makes me think of what the man's holding and I don't think it's actually on the floor. Maybe they're making yeah. themselves. Oh, gosh, they've got no shoes on. What, what do you think happens in this bit here? So this when is when all of the head pops in. <laughs> Who sits there, I, I wonder? Any ideas? Who might sit there in that bit? Any ideas? Oh, is Mr. T here? Yeah. Hello, Mr. T. Hi, uh, how are you? I've just, I've been watching, I've been watching what you're doing, Miss McKeezer. Oh, I'm uh, just, we're just having a little play, Mr. T. I'm just showing just, the children it. Can I just say, I, I was, I, I first came in when you were talking about the bread. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just, it was just so lovely to hear you all talking to each other about, about food. And I know some people are talking about what, um, what food. Anastasia, you're not talking about me, are you? I've just, Hi. I've just read someone like saying, oh, it's a creepy person. Hold on. I'm just about. talking about the person on the stage. <laughs> you are amazing. I think they're talking about the person that's kind yeah, of on the stage hiding. Yeah. Not, really not you, Mr. T. Not you. No, I was just looking at when you're talking about the bread and, and some people were saying that they recognise some of the bread from different countries and how I think Silaf was saying how, you know, if we go to Poland afterwards and have a look at what's yeah. going on there. And yeah, I just yeah. think it's so lovely the discussion you're having. Yeah, so we, we looked at the bakery, didn't we, guys? And we first looked at the picture and we saw people that didn't wear shoes and we didn't know what it was. And we saw Miss this Mickey on the wall. We thought it might be Arabic, but we wasn't sure. Um, so we might go back and have a look at that. I sometime. think that's great. And do you know what, Miss McKees, I'm going to let you have your discussions in a minute because I know some kids have got their hands up and they want to say something. Um, I, I just think it would be like lovely for us to eventually set some, like we can set little work for them to do so they can go onto it and search it themselves and have a look yeah. and do the work and type in their answers because your kids got such amazing answers, great yeah. ideas. Yeah. Um, I'm just really proud of you, but I've got to I've got to go and do some work now. I'm still in the meeting, but I'm just so glad that I dropped in on this one. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. So, like I said, literally, that was the first time I have ever, ever used Lifter, um, and the first time that the children had seen it as well. And really, how Lifter has supported our children and supported our teachers is a vehicle to open that discussion and to think really and to expose them to different countries, to different languages, to different people, to different ways of living, different foods, different, just everything different. Our children at our school, um, we live in a suburb of Leicester, which is extremely close to the city. You could walk there in sort of five, 10 minutes. They've never been to the city. They've never actually left the, the, the part where they live. So for the opportunity for the children to go and see and experience life in different countries, in different people's houses, it has just been amazing. And these were some of the quotes that um, I asked the children. So I asked the children, what do you enjoy about Lifter? Um, and I'll, you can see them there. So it shows you another way to live. Um, you can control it and you can go anywhere in the story world. So we started with very much the teachers taking control from the front and exploring and modeling to the children. 
some teachers did. I went all out in lockdown and just handed it over to them and said, go on, you explore, see what you can find out. And then we'll hold a discussion afterwards. And for me, that seemed to work really, really well. So um, the, the question that I started to think about and what I started to notice was our children, when we start talking about how do you find the area of a rectangle? What is a fronted adverbial? They kind of look at you and think, I know you've mentioned that, but I'm not really sure about what it is. So then I started to think about, well, they remember the story worlds and they remember what they learned and what they saw and they could understand the differences and look at how they were represented or how they weren't represented, which was really interesting. So when Lifty came in, the children started asking um, Lifty people, Serda uh, and Rahul, about why they hadn't got story worlds in this country in this country. Um, so that was a great experience. So yes, they could see themselves within the stories, but they were also starting to question, why, why have you not visited this place? Why haven't you been to here? Which was a great question for the children. So it really, it really led me to think about all of that teaching um, about cognitive science. So cognitive science tells us that for children to truly learn something, we need to make sure that, that we're not overloading them and that we're constantly going back and retrieving things and, and revisiting that knowledge. But it didn't always happen with Lifter. We'd only visit that story world once. And I just wondered why, why that was, and why did the children tune into that? Um, and I'm, I'm going to leave that as an open question at the minute, just while we discuss where we are. So at the minute, what do we do as a school? So Lifter is one session a week. Some teachers will spend 20 minutes. I could probably spend a whole day on one story world, but it's very much led by the children. So one session a week. And guess what? It doesn't always fit into the topic that we're studying. But my question is, so what? does it have to does everything have to link and for me personally I don't think it always does particularly when you've got a, a, a really exciting resource like Lifter so now every child has their own laptop and we use it as a tool to open up discussions and I think what Lifter supported us with is and I think Benny spoke about this earlier, is the idea of we don't just, our school, we don't participate in tokenistic days of it being, oh, it's Black History Month, so we need to do something about Black history. And the idea of actually Africa being quite an oppressed and deprived country and continent and all the countries within it. We as a school, we make sure that we're feeding that diversity throughout each day, each lesson, each week, each month. We've still got a journey to go on, um, but we've made a really, really good start. And our curriculum is, is based around challenging those stereotypes and decolonizing the curriculum. And that's what we use Lifter to support with. Um, and it's just, it just, it's working really, really well. So Hannah, would you mind? Um, flicking on just a, a few slides I've gone out of order a little bit I just wanted you to introduce you to Silaf could you possibly go back one for me so Silaf um, Silaf was one of the girls that was mentioned that was in that first screen um, that video and she started she really got me thinking um, she started to make connections and saying that's like the bread that we have in my country and what Lyft has done for her is she wanted to talk about her own country. She wanted to talk about her own cultures. And she really, really started something. She really was like an absolute trailblazer. So I was so proud of her. In front of the whole school, Scylla stood up and spoke about where she comes from, who she is. And children were amazed and they were so interested by her and she actually she's inspired so many children to talk about where they've come from who they are their experiences and not just children that are from other countries who speak additional languages children that are British born they want to speak about what their family life is like so it's she's been amazing um, and she told me that without Lifter I would never have felt confident to talk about my home country to children let alone the whole school 
And Lyfta has shown me that I can do anything that I want to, even though I might make, it might make me feel nervous. Um, and it just, we now have quite regular events of children coming up. They create their own PowerPoints and they, they just share and show and just that real chance to shine, which brings us back to that idea of our values of belonging, belonging to our school and showing that care. Um, and these are just some of the other um, sort of things that we do within school and a lifter is behind that you know our children come from the most deprived families in the east midlands but they're so giving that care is always there um yeah so i'm not sure what we're doing for time hannah um we've got 30 seconds until i need ah, to hand over 30 to lizzie seconds. brilliant any you want to ask a question <laughs> <laughs> Great to see a case study. Has anyone got any questions for Becky or you can put comments into the chat? I think it's great to see the possibility of how it gets embedded um, in the curriculum. Can I just say it's really brave of you to show yourself teaching during the oh, lockdown gosh. on Teams? That wasn't Maybe. my finest moment. No, no, but, but thank, like, good <laughs> on you for A, doing it and B, sharing it, because that's part of it, isn't it? It's the authentic approach to it. We're getting curious. I, yeah. I just loved how, how honest and raw that was, Becky. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, truly honest and raw. I'd never seen Lifter before. I'd got the login, opened it up with the children. We're on lockdown and we really felt like we were losing our values. We couldn't get to our children we couldn't see our children yes we were delivering maths and English and you know all of that stuff but our core principles we were we felt that we were lacking so Halil connected with Lifter and he just said to me have a go see what you can do and it really brought our principles our values back to the children even though that they were we, they were online um so yeah, it was it's really, great modeling, really great Becky. Thank you so much. So please do put comments and questions in the chat. I'm going to hand over now to Lizzie. Lizzie, it's lovely to have you here. A secondary colleague who's going to tell us how, how a secondary academy in London has embedded it. So Lizzie, welcome and over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I am the RSC uh, lead in South Bank University Academy. And I um, have basically been working with Lifter um, to make RSC uh, led PSHE and global citizenship lessons. Um, so what I've basically been doing is I've been looking at um, fitting these into our 30 minute uh, form time lessons once a week uh, in order to try and build um, more knowledge and experience of the real world to our school. So our school is, is very um, similar in the sense that it's quite a deprived area. A lot of the students don't have um, the opportunity to go outside of their own uh, postcode. So what we tend to do is um, try and bring the experiences into the school. And I thought it was really, really important that they understand just um, how lucky they are, even though they are from a deprived area. A lot of the time they, they see that um, as a very negative thing and uh, and use it almost as an excuse to say, oh, well, you know, I don't have this, therefore, um, oh, woe is me and people should should do things for me. Uh, when actually to be able to see people from across the world and how they deal with things, maybe even have less than these guys because they can still go home and, and play on their Xbox or things like that because their families have, have, have script is getting saved for them to have that uh, whereas these people don't have that they, some of them are homeless some of them um work on on barges or or um collect garbage you know that's uh, to create to create their own furniture and it's things like that where they they are just absolutely gobsmacked about how little other people have and how happy they are with what they do and what they've got um, and to create this positive experience to say, you know, what you have is incredible and, and you need to see it, the positive side of it a lot more. Um, so what uh, what we also have in this school is it's very multicultural in itself, um, but they don't tend to focus on each other's cultures. So um, we have uh, a lot of um sort of African students, we have lots of Asian students, we have uh, European students, we have um, those that don't speak much English, um, and yet they don't tend to 
mix a lot with each other. Uh, so they tend to stick mostly with sort of um, people that they're most comfortable in their cultural background. So it's really, really lovely to actually go to all of these areas um, where they speak different languages, where they have different cultures. Uh, and sometimes we have students that actually link to that area and that they can talk a little bit more about themselves and about um, their area. So what we really wanted them to do um, is see the difference in uh, in the world and, and how they can fit into that themselves. So it appealed really well with us, us for the, the visual aspect. So um, the idea of the globe turning at the very beginning and, and um, teleporting to all these different areas meant that it engaged our students um, and to be able to explore the world in 360 um, meant that it was different to, to what they were used to because what they're used to is either being spoken at by the teachers or um, videos and, and worksheets that they have to answer questions on. So to, to get rid of the worksheets and have it very oracy based and discussion based uh, really helped them to, to come out of their shells a little bit more and, and discuss what, what they liked or maybe what they learnt that's different. Um, so what we tend to do, even though we have the ability to work independently, we tend to have the whole group working um, together when it comes to exploring different worlds so that they can discuss with each other what they can see, what they uh, what they think about particular people and, and give their own opinions uh, to what they want. Um, so why did, um, why, how do we use it? So what I basically do is um, as the PSHE lead and global citizenship lead, uh, I give, um, I, I basically, create a PowerPoint, which looks like what, what you can see on the screen. And the idea behind it is, is um, it gives you the lift a lesson. It tells you sort of the theme that we're looking on. So for example, perseverance, it obviously gives the tutors um, a chance to follow some instructions so they know how to, how to go onto the lesson. And the link below takes them to where they need to be. So all they need to do is click the link, um, log in, press teach in front of class and then all they do is follow the instructions. Uh, what you'll see as well on the world is that um, in the other worlds that you've seen are there are multiple tabs whereas in this one there is just the one tab of the one place that they are going to focus on that lesson and it's going to change every week. Uh, so all form tutors can can follow this and they can lead the explorations if needs to. Um, of course, they can also get the students to lead the conversations um, based on the questions that they are asked throughout the journey. Um, what we focus particularly on lifted time and assembly formats, mainly because they are, um, we work with them to, to create these half an hour slots, whereas actually a lot of them are full hour uh, lessons, which is absolutely wonderful. We just didn't have the time for that, unfortunately. But these half an hour slots really help embed it into our curriculum and give us a bit of time to discuss it as well. Um, so that we can uh, we can really discuss with the kids what, what they like, what they don't like, uh, what, what they want to explore a bit further. Um, so some of the stories that, that they really, really enjoyed, um, they really liked, um, they, they really liked uh, one of them where they, they looked at stray dogs, um, which was really, really lovely um, because they, they, they built this form of empathy. They, they saw this man who um, didn't have a lot himself, but would always give to these stray dogs in his area. And going around seeing the kids they were just like oh my god that's so cute and you know seeing this video of him with all these dogs coming up to him and being able to pet them um they absolutely loved that one um i think they're, they're very they're instinctual you know they love uh, animals um and in particular as well a lot of discussion happened with um uh, a man who had lost his wife uh, and had to raise his young daughter by himself because a lot of our, our students have very split homes um, or have lost members of their family. And obviously um, being so young, I mean, they're, they're in high school, but a lot of particularly key stage three, um, they see that their, their relatives is quite strong and almost like they're not 
suffering in the same way and um and it's really really important to actually see the fact that this man is struggling um but he puts on this brave face for his little girl to make sure that she is okay and they discuss uh the loss of her mom um but he talks about how he misses her and the conversations that we had with the kids was unbelievable because they did not see it from the point of view of their parents they saw it from their own point of view which was well I'm struggling, but my parents don't seem to be um, because obviously they always try and put on this strong front for you and to try and keep on and move on. Um, so it's just been really, really wonderful to, to get them to understand how other people are feeling about uh, specific um, themes and topics and how it incorporates uh, PSHE and global citizenship, uh, both due to the fact that the themes to do with um, PSHE in regards to, uh, it could be a bereavement, it could be perseverance, it could be uh, bullying, whatever the case may be, there tends to be something on that, but also global citizenship in the fact that um, you see lots of different people from all over the world and what they have to deal with. Um, so some of our teachers are really enthusiastic. Um, we have members of, uh, staff who even though they teach for example drama and are naturally quite enthusiastic all of a sudden they get into their knowledge of geography comes out and you know they're talking about the country as a whole and go off on a complete tangent um we've got um some who just sort of go off the instructions and and to just do do all of the the discussion based topics and that's the joy of lifter as well is that if you're unsure about how to use it you follow the instructions and it's very very simple um, they'll ask you questions you follow what the question asks you to do and then you answer it um, so it doesn't matter how enthusiastic you are or how unsure you are you, it's it's very straightforward to to use and to navigate um, and it's really good as well to have discussions um, that are based within the questions because it gives the students a chance to be able to put their opinion forward um, which has been really really helpful and it gives you a sense of um, it gives you a sense of empowerment in what you're teaching as well because you have something to go off but you can also do your own questions and you can explore your own things based on the resources that are given to you so um, one of our PGC students takes our lifter uh, for form time and they just um they, they really seem to enjoy it they enjoy asking all the questions they enjoy uh, seeing what the kids can explore and and facilitating what to write down to answer those questions um so it's been just been absolutely lovely to to be able to see lots of different styles of teaching using it but also how much impact it's actually having on the students just on just hearing other people uh, and their points of view on things uh, before then giving their own point of view because they're very used to giving their own point of view at our school uh, but not so much hearing other people so it's really really nice to have that um oh i must have skipped this so, th so this is um the guy that that i was talking about about in regards to the stray dogs um so it develops this form of empathy that they get with um with just having this love of animals and seeing them all struggling and having this guy come up and feeding them and, and just showing the love. Uh, and it makes them sort of think, how how would I be in this situation? Like what, uh, would, you know, a lot of them were, were asking questions like, oh, I would take I would take them home with me. They wouldn't be stray. I would look after them. And I was like, yes, but would you look after like 10 dogs by yourself? And they would have to, you know, think about what they would do in that situation. Um, so they they really enjoyed him they found it interesting about the fact that even though he had a little himself that he would still give more to the animals um and it made them almost realize that they don't do that sometimes um and this is Mohammed. this is the guy who who looks after his daughter um paints and nails does everything that the mum used to do um but obviously make sure that there is um that there is an acknowledgement of his feelings as well and the fact that he's also struggling um so i think i don't know if we've got time i, I was asked to create a, a discussion question 
Um, so it will yeah. do it, Lizzie. Do you want to frame it? Go for it. Yeah. Okay. So um, I was asked to do a discussion question in regards to um, how how I deal with 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 Lifter and gives you guys a chance to discuss. The, the, the discussion question is: Can you think of an example where you've used a story to support students to find joy in a difficult situation? So. Um, in the sense that my students obviously um, feeling in a deprived way, um, they obviously take a lot of negatives in what they do. So using these stories, make them realize that actually there are a positive outlook on the way that you could, that your life is. And um, if there is a story that you could embark with your kids to try and have that same positive effect, what would it be? Awesome. So we've got three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18 people. I'm just going to pop us into some breakout rooms with three people. Um, so go have a chat for five or six minutes just with a couple of people and, 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 and have a chat about that question and anything else that's resonated with you as well. Here we go. OK, welcome back, um, everybody. Shall we just um, share some thoughts in the room about what you chatted about in your respective breakout rooms? Max, were they calling you? Were you with Anna? What, what did you talk about in your breakout room? Right, we, uh, there was just Missoon and myself, and unfortunately, Missoon's microphone wasn't working. Oh, no. <laughs> she typed in, um, I'm happy to listen, and I just told her a quick story about, you know, talking about finding a bit of joy in things. Um, I spent 20 years working with students who had all kinds of physical disabilities, uh, quite severe conditions, and some of them were non-verbal, so they couldn't actually speak. So they used to communicate, they used to use, um, you know, talkers, machines, like Stephen Hawking, that kind of thing. And um, in, in one, ex in one uh, example of this, um, I was teaching them the French numbers from one to 10. So I would speak them and say, this is what they sound like. And then I would write the spelling of them up and say, right, now put this into your talker. And of course, if you spell the words as they're written, you get, instead of un de trois, you get un dukes, trois, you know, that kind of thing. So it's totally useless. So the <laughs> task I set them was to think of combinations of letters they could type into their talk, which would actually produce the correct sounds or as near as possible to un de trois. And, you know, we, we spent an entire lesson doing this. So, you know, three quarters of an hour uh, trying all different combinations. And A, it was really success, successful because they actually managed to do it and, and get the talkers to say un de trois. But also they, everyone was dissolving in heaps of laughter at, at, you know, during this, because it was so funny, they were trying all kinds of things. And one of the important points about this, I think, is, as I was saying to Missoon, that if you're in that position where you're relying on your speech through a device, um, those students generally had very little agency into the actual vocabulary that was in those talkers, because it was always programmed in by somebody else, you know, somebody from a communications team or somebody like that. And so this exercise actually was a way of them having a bit of agency about actually what went into the, uh, the actual device that they, they lived with on a, on, a, on a daily basis was part of their essential communication with the outside world. So it was a really interesting- Yeah, I love that, I love that, Max. I can hear the joy, I can hear the humour, I can hear the yeah. fact that it could have been a potentially yeah, quite great. difficult navigation, but actually you found a positive kind of frame on that. So that's lovely, thank you, Max. Okay. Um, let me come to you, Selena. What, what did you share? What did you hear in your breakout room? You're on mute, you're on mute, darling. Gideon, yeah, it's Gideon uh, Hammond was telling us about his uh, his school and what he was looking for. Um, and yeah, Becky was just telling him about, um, you know, how Lifter could fit in and, and work for him. He was looking for things that, um, yeah, that, yeah the, 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 the benefits of using his own story um, and, and the different stories from, from the Lifter site. That is a great segue to my next slide. So thinking about how we share um, stories, like we're thinking obviously about the pupils through Lifter, but we also need to think about how we share the adult stories around lived experience. And one of the things we do is that we put out um, blogs to amplify diverse voices. So I think we've published our 250th blog um, this week. So please do check out the blog, short, 
short sharings um, from people from all different walks of life showing what they're, how they're navigating um, education. Um, and we've recently published a book with 125 voices in education to so thinking about how we how we disrupt some of the adult narratives around the kind of the dominant stories um, out there, I think is a really important part of this work when it comes to DEI in schools as well. So the final thing I'd like to ask you all today is to think about from everything you've listened to from our various speakers, like what might your pledge be? What might your commitment be to your takeaway from the session around this idea of human storytelling and how we how we leverage um, stories as part of the curriculum, as part of the kind of the work we do around creating belonging in our schools? Can I ask you all to put an idea um, into the chat, please, about something you're going to go away and think about or go away and do or go away and get curious about? Just be interested to see. What our takeaways are going to be. Becky's taking us on a tour of the school. <laughs> Sorry, I'm I'm coming from Halil's classroom, Mr. T. Yep, this is our main corridor. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> nice displays. <laughs> Where we branch out. So I'm going to find my daughter. She's somewhere in school. <laughs> all good, Becky. It's all good. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm just trying but, to... Well, you don't need to type and walk at the same time, but I'm interested to hear from everybody else what some of our commitments are going to be, some of our reflections and takeaways. Awesome. Max is going to go and talk to the head, get some budget, get some time. I love that, Max. I'll connect you with Anna and Harriet so you can follow up. Um, Anna's still going to think about how we layer stories, get those multiple perspectives. Yeah, brilliant. Get different, get, get different views around a topical theme. Yeah, Selena for amazing and um, people in schools thinking about continually um, developing those resources and amplifying those diverse voices. Thank you, Selena. I think I want to get access to um, Benny's Padlet that she was talking about for those resources. Yeah, brilliant. So Benny did a Padlet per month last year where she unpacked each of the protected characteristics and for every day for that month she tweeted out a book you need to read about religion a book you need to read about race so it is literally 365 books um you might have to go and ask Halil for a big budget to fill up the staff library but it definitely gives people an idea about how to disrupt their own um knowledge around some of those topics Becky so I'll, I'll get them from her and I'll share them um Thank you. I see a few more comment, comments here. Having conversations with like-minded people. Yeah, Masoon, I love that. So thinking about who we connect with and who we collaborate with and how we can create some momentum or share some resources around this. Um, that's a lovely approach. And Gideon's put about giving teachers greater power to tell different stories. Absolutely, Gideon. So creating that safe space in schools for us to share our own stories as a way in. Um, and and to use our own lived experience if, it, if if appropriate, I think that's really really powerful as well. Harriet's commitment is to look at Benny's curated diverse ed toolkit. Love that, Harriet. I will put both the toolkits um, into the follow up email um, as well. So I'm going to end there so that everyone can go and put the kettle on and make themselves a cup of tea if they're on GMT. I know some of you are over in the States, so it's probably a, a, a very different time for you over there. But thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'll be in touch in the next couple of days with all the various links. Um, Good question, Gideon. It's not as easy as what is what is the cost because it's based on how many pupils you have. So maybe DM Anna or Harriet or follow up with them about the cost to the school of it. Thank you. Um, thank you, Anna. Talking book is a good resource. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you for your signposting, Anthony, in the chat. So lovely to meet you all. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and, and I'll follow up in the next few days. Go and enjoy your day, your evening.